Hello everyone, this is Michael Bray at the Developmental Disabilities Institute. I hope you all can hear me well. Um, I just wanted to go over a couple housekeeping items here before we get started with the first webinar. Um, if you can see on the screen here, um, we, let's see, uh, as you probably already under, uh, can guess, we have a weekly webinar registration email that will be going out. Uh, this is for each webinar individually. If you emailed previously to sign up for the webinar series, um, we are taking care of entering your name and sending these emails, so all you have to do is enter your first and last name and your email address and you will be getting the reminders weekly uh, for each webinar as it comes up. Um, all the materials for each webinar, including the recorded webinars, uh, will be located on the webinar archive page at ddi.wayne.edu slash Webin Archives, W-E-B-I-N-A-R-C-H-I-V-E-S dot P-H-P, and I'll send a link out to that to everyone as well, so you can, it's readily available. Um, all of the videos will be on there, the materials for each webinar will be on there to uh, click on and download and save. Uh, as well as all deadlines, uh, and that's another aspect of this. If you are pursuing the continuing education credits uh, for the webinar series, uh, all the related deadlines for submission of materials are on that page. Um, if you have any questions at any time, please continue to email uh, ddi at wayne.edu. Um, we get back to everybody as quickly as we can, so if you do have questions, please send them there. Um, I think that's it. Just a, a couple things about the webinar platform itself for GoToWebinar. Uh, you'll notice down in the uh, bottom right, there's a chat window. You can type in your questions here, and we can address those as we go through uh, the webinar. So please, uh, if you have questions at any time, go ahead and type them in there, uh, and we will uh, try to address them all before the end of the webinar. Okay. Oh, I had that on private. Uh, usually they will be sent to everyone. Um, so without further ado, I will give you Elizabeth Jenks, and she will commence the first in the series of webinars. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm so pleased everyone could join us today. And um, with our weather being what it has been this winter, isn't it nice to be able to do this from the convenience of a warm place? Um, let me tell you a little bit about the Developmental Disabilities Institute. We are located at Wayne State University. We are one of 63 national and international sites of university centers on educational excellence and developmental disability. We are funded, one of our main funders is AIDD, the Administration on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities out of Washington, D.C. And our primary mission is to build inclusive communities for individuals with disabilities and their family members um, as well. I'm a social worker. I'm also the Associate Director of Training and Community Support at the Developmental Disabilities Institute. And I am um, to do training and teaching around disability and today we're going to talk about the historical perspective of developmental disability and review the three major models that have influenced this field. Um, before we start I have a couple of little things that I would like to cover with you. Um, we're going to meet every Thursday, um, as Michael said earlier, and we have nine webinars in our series. This is a field test, which means this will not be the final course. Um, we are evaluating the course and the content of the course, and I'm inviting, I'm looking for eight people to be a part of our disability webinar leadership course um, review team or, or focus group, as you will. So I'm looking for a diverse group, and if you would like to be a part of this team, it means that you have to participate each week um, in the webinar, and then you will come to DDI uh, for a one and a half hour meeting. I will feed you, 
Michael will conduct a focus group and we want to find out what you think, what, what has worked in this uh, process, what can we do better. And then it is our hope, as with most field tests, that we will take the information and we will um, improve the course and we will run the course um, again. So um, that is my hope and I'm hoping that you will come forward. You can email me at e.janks at wayne.edu. My last spelling, uh, my spelling is on the PowerPoints, J-A-N-K-S if you would like to be a part of the focus group. And I think I forgot to mention, you get a $50 gift card for coming for the meeting and participating in the webinar series, as well as your certificate of completion. Um, let's talk about the expectations of participants, especially those of you who are participating with uh, the anticipation that you will get the continuing education credits. Each week you'll need to complete a pre and a post test. You will need to complete each webinar um, each week. Now that I've gotten many questions, does that mean I have to be participating um, right at the time the webinar is, is you know, um, running? And the answer to the question is no. About 24 hours after the um, live version of the webinar rolls out, you will be able to archive a, um, a webinar, taped version of the webinar. So you can listen to it at that time. We do understand that it's very difficult for people to commit to a specific time over a nine-week period. So you will be able to access it after the live version. Um, we will need from you your pre and your post test. Mike has put a slot there for your name. It's very important you put your name on everything that you submit to us, except for the evaluation form. Mike just reminded me. Um, and we will anticipate that you will complete the homework assignment each week. This is a competency-based assignment that shows that you can demonstrate what we taught you for, for that week's webinar. Um, and you will return that to me with your name on it as well. I will keep track of everyone's work. Um, I will also, and for those social workers who are tuned in, you know what sticklers they are at the Michigan chapter of the National Association of Social Workers about knowing who's actually participated, that they've actually participated, that they've completed a competency-based assignment before they will give you the continuing education credits. At the conclusion of the webinar, I will uh, review everyone's uh, work. I will um, let people know who got the CEs, who completed. They will receive a certificate. I will keep all that information here in a locked file in my office at DDI. If you are ever audited as a social worker because you have your continuing education requirements, you can contact me uh, or the Institute and we will be able to look up the information and provide you with that. Um, again, if there's any other questions related to continuing education credits, please feel free to email me or um, call me on that. Um, without any further ado, I would like to, I guess I should also mention that those of you who are listening and are not going to be participating in the CEs for social work credit, you will also receive a certificate of completion from the developmental disability that you completed this leadership course um, if you participated in all nine weeks, okay? So um, I'd like to show you a, a little video now. It's called possibilities and it's about a woman um, named Greta and her life in the community. This is our DDI possibilities series. I think Greta and her was that growing up with her I saw that that limit her enthusiasm and it limit her drive and desire to excel past what her physical limitations were. My mom and my sister taught me when I was small to do my sister gene for yourself. First time I met her was very shocked because at first I never told me her but I was disabled. So from one of my conversation with uh, uh, Dr. Joshua is she goes to work and they, they travel together and uh, Greta Brandon is very funny and funny jokes. So, so I do not think someone to uh, incorrect to, 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 uh, to be wrong. 
Well, I chose there are, there are six stories in our possibilities series, and if you'd like to see more of them, um, you can visit our website at ddi.wayne.edu. I chose this particular story because Greta is, um, you know, was very fortunate. Her family um, kept her within their family and um, treated her like any other member of their family, and so she was offered an, and experienced so many great opportunities. Um, and she's living a very full life. Um, but we're going to talk about today uh, a little bit. We're going to start out talking about an era when that was was not what most children with disabilities experienced. And before we begin talking about the medical model, I'd like to go over the learner objectives. Um, the learner will define three models within the field of developmental disabilities. Um, you'll identify a key princi principle of each model. You'll define one outcome of the ecological perspective um, for the field of developmental disabilities. And you'll define three goals of the community membership paradigm. Just trying to figure out, bear with me, I'm trying to figure out why we are not advancing our slides. Okay, I was concerned I couldn't advance the slide, but that's okay. All right, I'm not working on my laptop. I'm working on Michael's laptop, so I'm, a, I'm experiencing some technical difficulties. Bear with me. Um, so there have been you know, um, various models, but these are the three main models which have defined the field for practice um, for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And we're going to start with the medical model, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the developmental model. And you might also know the developmental model as the professional bureaucratic model um, as well. And then we're going to talk about the kind of the era we're at now, which is the community membership model. and um, where people are living in inclusive communities and um, living independent lives. So let's start, though, with a little history that will take us back into time. The, um, the early era of the United States, uh, people with disabilities either lived in their family homes, um, stayed, you know, there were lots of farms, things like that. Um, they stayed with their family. Um, but other, other children and adults who had disabilities um, were put into almshouses, which were also known as poor houses um, back in early American history. Um, they did not receive any special services. Um, they just languished there, um, either in their homes um, where they were pretty much isolated or in almshouses where they were warehoused. And, um, you know, in that was kind of the way it was around the world at that time as well. And the, the realization that, that a child with a disability could learn really started back in uh, France with Dr. Jean Ithard, um, who found a little boy wandering around um, his, his land, and he brought him in and cleaned him up and began to educate him. And he found out he could teach him how to eat. He taught him how to get dressed. He taught him skills. Dr. Itard had a journal about this, this child and this child's accomplishment. And he um, started just talking about this and doing lectures. And, and this, this thought process began to emerge that people with disabilities could learn, children with disabilities could learn. And this was the beginning of this seed being planted that people needed to have more than just custodial care, that they needed to be educated as well and could be educated. Around the same time um, in the uh, late 1800s uh, was um, the belief of social Darwinism. Many of you have heard of this before. Um, Darwin's famous theory of evolution that only the best of specimens, um, including human beings, would survive. Those that were not uh, as desirable um, or had imperfections would not evolve. And it created this stigma around disability um, that that they were, there was something wrong with you if you had a disability. And people were shunned and hidden away. Disability was viewed as an illness and a weakness. And it led to the creation of 
institutions, which really began out east. And this is where we saw the beginning of many, many large institutions where children were dropped off and adults with disabilities were pretty much left at the door um, to be cared for in these large institutions. This is the era we call the medical model. And the reason why we called it the medical model is because there was a belief that, thinking back to the Darwin theory, that there was something wrong with the individual, that there was a, like a sickness um, that needed to be cured. Disability was treated as a weakness, and there were very there were not services out there either for for families to depend on at this time. And doctors, for lack of better information to share with families um, and well-intentioned physicians, um, told parents to put their children into institutions, that it would be best to forget that they were born and to go on with their family life and have other children and that, you know, it's okay that the government would take care of their child and um, it would be um, the most desirable thing to do for them. Again, there weren't community services available at that time and so it, the, the school of thought was this was the best for families and children. In the 1960s, we began to see the emergence of a new model. And before we go forward with that, I'd like to explain something. Um, there were not distinct time frames on these models. All right, so I can't really say to you, all right, the medical model was from 1800 to 1960. And in 1960, the developmental model started. And from 1960 to 1980, 80, it was the developmental model, and then from 1980 to now is the community membership model. There's overlapping here, so please, as you're listening to the presentation, understand that there is some overlapping as the new model begins to take hold in the field and evidence-based practices change, all right? So there are no distinct timelines here, although we can kind of say an era. We, we, we know when the change really does start to take hold. Um, during the medical model, physical symptoms of disabilities um, were treated uh, with iron lungs for people who had polio. Um, they also wore braces. There was phenobarbital to control seizures. There were not a lot of other medications. Pain management and seizure control was the goal um, whenever possible. Um, pain management at this time was not done in the individual's home. Uh, so often as it was done in a hospital and institutions. And this was also the time when pain was managed for long-term uh, hospital care um, for people who had polio. It was not unusual um, or other disabilities for them to be hospitalized for long periods of time. Uh, pain management was often uh, thought the best thing to do was to help the individual um, be comfortable, um, to rest. Um, and while this controlled some of the pain, it also resulted in less waking opportunities to participate in educational and social um, things that could improve one's life. So medications that promoted sedation were promoted um, at times also to make direct care workers' lives easier within institutions. I think I, okay. Okay, so we're going to get to this area now where we're going to talk about the creation of a new paradigm. But before we do that, I'd like to show you a brief um, clip. It's called Willowbrook, The Last Great Disgrace. And it's about three minutes long. And you're going to see one of the large institutions um, in upper state New York where many, many people with disabilities developmental disabilities was they were warehoused. I visited the state institutions for the mentally retarded and I think yeah, particularly at Willowbrook that we have a situation that borders on the
way back in 1965, and somehow we'd all forgot. I first heard of this big place with the pretty sounding name because of a call I received from a member of the Willowbrook staff, Dr. Michael Wilkins. The doctor told me he'd just been fired because he'd been urging parents with children in one of the buildings, building number six, to organize so they could effectively improve conditions for their children. The doctor invited me to see the conditions he was talking about, so unannounced and unexpected by the school administration, we toured building number six. He warned me that it would be bad. Yes, that was a very young uh, Geraldo Rivera. That was a documentary um, that was made in 1972, um, and it was an expose on Willowbrook and the um, terrible conditions there. Um, and the realization you heard the doctor speaking that you know children could learn and needed to be educated and in their home environments, and that the um, the sadness and the the, 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 the really um, uh, despair of the people living in that institution could be seen, I think, as you uh, viewed that clip in their faces. And it was a very um, devastating thing for families. Um, parents were only allowed to go visit on Sundays. Um, some parents never could bring themselves to go back to see their child again. And um, it was a very dark part of our history, um, but at least um, some good came out of it, and we're going to talk about that, how we evolved um, into the next paradigm. Um, and partially that was that was due to this expose and the realization that, um, you know, we needed something better. And as in any time when change occurs, several things have to happen at the same time. Um, the institutions were getting old. They were getting very costly for states to ar operate. Abuse surface, uh, surfaced at many of the institutions. Um, families began to realize that uh, the institutions were not what they had hoped they would be and what they were promised to be. And they began to organize. And many of you know about one of the, the, the premier and founding advocacy uh, organizations of family members that began at this time, the ARC, which was originally the Association of Retarded Citizens and now known as the ARC. Um, and other things were going on. Families began and individuals began to sue states um, for the deplorable conditions and, and the treatment that people were receiving in the institutions. Negative publicity began to surface about um, the institutions in the media. You saw that uh, Senator Robert Kennedy had gone there years before they actually even closed it down and was appalled at what he saw. And you may remember that, um, and I think they mentioned it in the clip, that Senator Kennedy had a sister uh, named Rose that, that had um, intellectual disabilities and mental health disabilities. And uh, all this negative publicity and expose began to get out to society in general and the community. 
institutions began to be heard. It was around this time that President Kennedy de um, develops the um, appoints people to the president's panel on mental retardation in 1960 when he became president. Um, the Kennedys um, have done a lot to, um, you know, improve. Uh, education and community for people with uh, developmental and intellectual disabilities and President Kennedy appointed the President's Association on Mental Retardation which led to the development of University Centers for Educational Excellence in Developmental Disability which is what DDI is. Um, people began to become uh, out of the group homes. Um, they were living in large group homes but they were coming out of the institutions and going to community settings. Um, communities uh, were becoming more accepting of people with disabilities. Um, up until this time, remember, there was no special or regular education for children. That did not start until 1975. Um, but some school districts did take kids with disabilities and they did educate them and they were doing, in some cases, forms of inclusive education. Um, and some parents were educating their children at home because other districts were not as open-minded about accepting children with disabilities. Well, it was what happens with many models as they f first come into, um, you know, development is there was a lack of planning for this particular model. Um, the institutions closed fairly quickly. Um, there wasn't a lot of planning out in community yet for people, and so there were some problems um, at the advent of this model. But little by little, um, you know, things began to develop, and be between the research that, that was coming out of the field um, that was showing that people with disabilities could learn best in communities, um, advocacy movements, policy and legislation was formed that supported um, community mental health, education for people with disabilities. Um, you know, a little, uh, 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 the, the model began to take hold, the developmental model began to take hold, and finally, um, you know, there was more out in community for people to be engaged in and to, to lead a better quality of life. Um, around this time also, um, Yuri Bronfenbrenner, he pioneered systems theory. He actually, this theory started in child development, um, but is now viewed as a systems theory that can be applicable to um, helping people with developmental disabilities uh, identify support systems. Um, his theory viewed like life as layers of an onion, if you will, um, and we're going to talk a lot more about that, and by that I mean the person is the focus of, um, you know, the central focus, and then the people that that individual interacts with are um, the second layer um, of, of kind of supports for people, and we're going to get into this a lot more later on in the presentation. Right now, I'd like to talk about um, Wolf Wolfensberger's contribution to the field um, with his uh, normalization theory and normalization then became known as social role valorization so some of you are familiar with uh, the latter term which uh, is basically the concept that people with disabilities can learn and they can be a part of society but they just have to have opportunities and they have to have supports. Um, some people find the word normalization offensive, um, but I think it holds its place uh, as a very important concept because it was truly the beginning of research and um, which later on influenced practice around the idea that um, direct care workers and people, family members, could support people with disabilities and teach them skills so the community could become accessible to them. Um, and I'd like to show you a little uh, clip at this point that Wolf Wolfensberger um, kind of it, it explains um, 
normalization, I think, a little bit further in social role valorization. And I'm going to read it because it's it doesn't really have any words to it, so I think it might be um, it might work a little bit better. But it was the it's it's very short. It's three minutes, but I think it's really a very good clip that explains a kind of very complex con uh, concept. Imagine life without light. Imagine life without family. Imagine life without you being you. It's hard to imagine life without all we have. Wolf Wolfensberger created social role valorization. He recognized the importance of valuing people. He recognized that people need to contribute. Before Wolf Wolfensberger, there was little hope if you had any condition, mental health or disability. This changed attitudes for people living like this. to living like this. Okay. So that's a very nice, um, I thought it was just a very good presentation of um, kind of a, an overview of the importance of Wolf, Wolfensberger's contribution um, to the field of disability. Um, he did a lot of research that um, influenced evidence-based practice and there were other things as well that influenced the advent of the new model, um, which led to the community membership model. And we're going to talk about those. I'm just trying to advance my slides. Bear with me. I am on the space bar, but hold on. We'll get to it. All right. Thank you. I want to go back up. Yeah, um, I skipped this slide. So I want to talk a little bit about things that were going on as well, um, besides what was going on in the research world, um, uh, you know, in the field. There was a growing grassroots effort. Parents were organizing like they had never done before. Um, people with disabilities were coming forward and saying that what they needed and want. The advocacy movement began at this time as well. Again, this is like, you know, um, late 60s, uh, early 70s, um, the passage of IDEA, there was legislation that supported the community, um, the movement to community, and that included the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act of 1975, which mandated special education services for the very first time. Other support systems were funded in the community. Um, grants became available and, and monies became available to support um, you know, advocacy um, within each state and university centers like DDI um, and the ARCs. And the model began in, in, in colleges and universities around taking away the stigma and the psychopathological model, which again, psychopathological, meaning that something is wrong, to a psychosocial model meaning that people can be integrated um, and that um, community membership, it, it should be expected. Um, so let's review here a little bit. Normalization and its meaning to people with disabilities is just the thought that people can be educated in community environments um, and learn what they need to do uh, to be successful in community. 
we're moving away from services and specialized programs um, and into integrated community settings. Day programs and workshops, um, that was also a part of the developmental model. Um, they weren't really translating to success for people. They weren't translating into real jobs for real pay. And we been, began to question uh, at the end of the developmental model, what do people need to live in a community? How do people journey from clienthood to community membership? How do people attain a real quality of life? Okay, now let's revisit that earlier slide that I talked about. Well, one way we, we can begin to design what we need for people, um, uh, you know, who had disabilities and have intellectual disabilities is this theory of the ecological perspective because it's an organizing framework and it can help us identify circles of supports for people. And if that sounds familiar, it's also what we use today in person-centered planning. It looks at a person's life. It identifies areas where that person might need um, more um, interaction. And it identifies who will support people in those interactions. The most important characteristic of the ecological perspective is that it reinforces our inclination to look inside the individual and, ex and explanations about that individual's behavior and development. We have to look at the whole person. The ecological perspective also looks at the environment and barriers that impact that individual's life. The ecological perspective influenced the clinical world as well um, with the advent of psychosocial therapy and the idea that uh, people's lives are not in a vacuum, that our lives are enriched by the number of interactions that we have um, in a day, in a week, in a month. And how do we get to that for a person with disability? Well, we have to offer them choices. We have to allow freedom for them to take risks. And we have to give them the right to live the quality of life that they want. And we're going to talk more at the end of the presentation about how we're going to use um, ecological perspective and systems model for our homework assignment this week. Quality of life should not be defined by social workers or public professionals. The quality of life should be determined by that individual. And way back in 1970, there was a, a landmark conference and it was landmark because it was one of the very first conferences of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who became advocates. And they wrote a paper at this conference. And it was widely published. And this is what they asked for. They said, we want to live independently. We don't want to live you know, where other people tell us to live. We don't want to have roommates that we don't know. We want to learn skills. We want to learn how to cook. We want to learn how to budget and manage our own money. We don't want to be coddled and treated specially and treated like we have an illness. We want more interesting jobs. We don't want jobs cleaning. We don't want jobs, today it would be shredding papers. In those days it was, you know, again, cleaning. Um, you know, um, very non-challenging types of, of work um, without creative options, without much money associated with it. We demand the right to marry, have relationships, and have children. We want to be trained and educated for better work that will turn into real dollars so we can live independently and have a quality of life. The message was clear. People wanted to be free. They wanted dignity. They wanted personal fulfillment. Does that sound familiar to all of us as we listen to this? Whether you have a disability or you don't have a disability, right? These are the things all people want and strive for in society. The field began to take note. 
research was advanced that eventually led to best practices in the community. It was the development, and we're still working towards this, right, of a holistic service system where people can live in their community and get what they need. We're still not there yet, but we're working towards it. It's key that barriers have to be broken down in communities so that people can live inclusively. And it's often this thought that back, you know, many years ago when we were in the developmental model, we thought that people had to learn a specific skill. They had to be toilet trained before they could go to a job. They had to stack a three cube tower before they could do a job. Now, in a community membership model, we look at the idea that, no, people can belong and do belong in communities, but it's up to us to reduce the barriers. It's up to us to change the environment so people can be fully included. It's not up to the person with a disability to learn a specific skill set to be included. It's a very different thought process, isn't it? Wraparound services, that holistic, lifelong service delivery system is what we're striving for. We also want what we would call natural supports and people in the community to be our support services. Policy has to support implementation. And some of that has already happened with the implementation of the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, which you know, was signed into law to remove barriers within the workplace environment. The Developmental Disabilities Act, um, which identified what people need uh, to, to be in community and also identified um, criteria so that people could access community mental health services. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which we talked about earlier in 1975, which mandates special education. AIDD, the Association with for, in, the Association of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, um, and NIH, uh, National Institute of Health, and OSERS, which is the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitation Services, have funded um, exemplary programs through grants that have had a positive impact on the lives of people with disabilities. So these are all formal bureaucratic systems changes, legislation policy that have led to a community membership and quality life for individuals. And program design should incorporate people with disabilities. We should be asking them, what do you need? What do you want? How can we improve our services? People should be paid for their time and their expertise as they support um, program development and participate. The community membership model allows for no alternatives to community. Community is for everyone. Any society that excludes one excludes all. And I, I believe that if you know diversity is the key, if all the flowers in the garden were the same, it would be a pretty boring garden. And, you know, it's the same with our communities. Communities will evolve naturally. We, forcing communities is not how they will evolve and meet the needs of what we need as a society. And that includes, you know, sometimes uh, communities where we have people who all have a specific disability living together. Um, you know, we may have to revisit the way our elders are living as well in this paradigm. Um, it is our hope that the next paradigm or model will not be needed. Why do you think that would be possible? Okay, I'd like to conclude, think about that, but I'd also like to conclude with a, um, a, a DVD, a clip that is, is uh, by the ARC and the Macomb Oakland Regional uh, Center Incorporated. It's on the Michigan history of the closing of our institutions. As many of you know, we closed our last institution a few years ago, which was not pleasant. And this is a little history of our journey um, as a forward-thinking state um, without institutions and with more individualized supports for people in the community.
such as Lapeer, Fort Custer, Mount Pleasant, Plymouth, Farmington, and Newberry. An institution, perhaps, but it is also a school. It is a hospital. It is a training facility for the mentally retarded. Some persons will stay here for the rest of their lives. Many, through the result of past study and research, will be trained for certain jobs and trained to help themselves too. Then, when their training has been completed, they will be set out to become useful citizens, contributing a small but necessary share to our civilization.
that um, was a Michigan history of our state institutions uh, for people with disabilities. Um, Michigan, just like every other state, uh, institutions in that era. And fortunately, we have closed our last institution, Mount Pleasant Center, um, a few years ago. Um, we are no longer an ICFMR state. And we have really made a commitment. Um, our, our major agencies of our state, Department of Community Health, um, they made a real commitment to closing institutions and supporting community living. And so we are forward thinking in this state. There are other states, uh, such as Texas, that still has an ICFMR facilities um, um, and, and large scale institutions for people. But in Michigan, we have, as a state, um, as state agencies, policy legislation to support individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities in communities. Um, we have really made a commitment towards that and supporting financially um, systems that will support that as well. Let's talk a little bit about um, the assignment uh, as we conclude our PowerPoint. Uh, someone did ask if the PowerPoint was um, available, and I'm going to let Mike speak to that, how we can access the PowerPoint later today or tomorrow. Uh, yeah, well, I'll go ahead and add a link um, to the webinar archive page for the PowerPoint for each presentation. Uh, I'm going to show that page after Elizabeth's done with her presentation so that everybody can see what I'm talking about. Uh, and I, and uh, I will also share the link again to that page uh, so everybody can uh, make note of that. Okay, thank you. Um, this, this is kind of one of the diagrams of the ecological perspective. And you received an assignment. Um, the webinar homework assignment for week one was about Mary. And you have that vignette. So, okay, we're going to link it. I, Okay, apparently you all have not received it yet, but we will make sure you receive it, okay? And it's what it is, is it's a little story about a Mary who's 20 years old. She currently lives at home with her parents, and she's going to be transitioning to her own place. So you're going to read that, and then what you're going to do is, uh, on a piece of paper, you're going to draw three circles, four circles, and you're going to map out uh, Mary's life identifying who she interacts with, her support systems, and so on. So let me let me take you through what that should look like, okay? Because I don't expect people to complete an assignment without, you know, having the directions and having the directions fully explained. So in the center circle, that's your micro system, okay? In that in the center, very center circle. Now you can Google this, all right, and you're gonna see hundreds of different ways that you can diagram the ecological perspective ecosystems um, with circles. But this I'm giving you a very basic um, doing this. And my reasoning for this is because I think most of us, uh, whether we're family members, whether we're social workers, you, we're trying to map out what has in their life, what, where there are gaps in their lives, and how can we fill those gaps and get to their goals and what they want to have a quality of life, right? Keep it kind of a, a little simple and easy for everyone to identify what's needed. So in the center is going to go the person, and that would probably be Mary. That first layer, we're going to put the people she interacts with on almost a daily basis or a daily basis, OK? And those are people like spouses, direct care workers, um, you know, could be teachers, parents, okay, people that you interact with. On that second circle are the systems, mesosystem folks that you don't necessarily interact with on a daily basis. And that would be like the people you see at church or your supervisor at the workplace, a teacher, and excuse me if I said teacher before on the, on the second layer. Again, that's someone you might come in contact with three days a week, five days a week, but not every day, okay? So the folks that in circle are the people that you don't interact with on a daily basis, but they're a part of your life. 
Um, the exosystem, the third circle. Now, those are mostly institutions um, and places that you um, that you don't really ever see an individual in that in that institution or at that agency or in that organization. Policies um, may influence your life. Okay, and they're important to identify. Um, because as we take this to the next step in person-centered planning, you know, we might need to know what are the policies, why can't we do this? Well, as we examine that more fully, we might see, well, all right, uh, we can't do an inclusive classroom because the school worked that. All right, so it's important as you go through this process to identify the institutions, organizations, agencies, etc., that influence a person's life. Okay, through their policy, funding, and their rules. All right? So as you read the vignette about Mary, you're going to identify some of those institutions first, and you're going to put them on those circles. Okay? So here's assignment one. Um, we already talked a little bit about Mary. You're going to use take a blank piece of paper. This does not have to be fancy, and it doesn't have to be beautiful. I'm just really looking for you to identify where people go because I want this to be a tool you can use if you haven't done this before to help you identify um, what people need in their lives um, that they want to have to improve their life and to make it more inclusive, um, a more interesting and really a higher quality of life. So it's a tool that you can use along with the person-centered planning process. I'm looking for people to put the identified people in that story, that vignette if you will, in the correct uh, circles. So here's your directions for the assignment. Review the vignette about Mary. Draw the three circles on a blank piece of paper. Put the identified people, agencies, etc. within the correct circles. Return the assignment to me by next Tuesday at noon. Oh, Michael said to me he put 5 p.m. Tuesday, which is fine. So don't, nobody has to panic. It's on the web page, 5 o'clock, Tuesday. Fax it to me. If you don't want to, you could do a couple of things. You could scan it, you know, email it to me. That would be one way you could do it. Um, or for folks that don't want to do that, you can fax it to me, and that's our number, 313-577-3770. Make sure you put your name on it. Make sure you put my name on it, that it's coming to me, um, so that I'll have it. And my email is also on this slide. Now, the certificate and the CEUs are dependent on you completing all the assignments. If you have questions regarding the assignment, you can always email me, all right? And I'm willing to entertain your questions that way. Or you can also call me at 248-990-6467. And that is myself, but I don't mind putting it out there because I know sometimes people have a question and I'm not always on my email when your question arises, so that's another way that you can um, access me. So we have some questions. Michael pointed out to me that some of you have some questions. This is a time for um, Q&A. And um, any questions that we have, we're going to obtain them right now. Again, we will need the assignment. Um, I'm not, I guess I want to just put your minds at rest about, I'm not looking here for you to do on the assignment every single, you know, every single person or whatever in that vignette. And I'm not going to be, if you get too along or you don't want to identify a few, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get the credit for it. All right? I'm basically looking here for, this is a credit, no credit situation. And I'm looking for that people who basically grasp the concepts on this. So please don't get nervous about it um, you know, or upset. Um, but we do need you to complete the assignment for those CDs. One of the questions that came in was, is the PowerPoint available for download? Uh, if you can, I'm showing on the screen right now the DDR webinar series archive, page where I will be posting uh, all of the archived video recordings of the webinars. Uh, and as you can see for week one, right below where the video will be, um, hopefully, hoping to have the video up by noon tomorrow. Uh, hopefully a little earlier so that you can access it if you need to. Um, the pre-test, the assignment, and the post-test 
as well as the evaluation for the webinar itself are all linked there. You can click on those uh, to access these forms in PDF format. Uh, what we will do as well this week is email a copy of the assignment to everyone, um, but you can access it either way. Okay? And notice right below each spot, so for week one, um, there's the deadline, 5 p.m. on Tuesday, March 11th, uh, as well as the fax number and Elizabeth's email. Uh, if you have uh, any questions or if you want to submit your uh, activities that way. Another question came, let's see, can we do the tests online? I couldn't enter anything. Well, unfortunately for these, we, they are in PDF, however, um, you know, you'll have to save them, print them out, um, and you can mark them up that way. Uh, or if you uh, are familiar with marking up and highlighting answers, you can do it that way and mail it as well, or email it as well. Um, we're working on uh, getting all of these forms uh, converted into fillable PDFs so that, uh, fillable PDFs or Word documents so that uh, participants can simply um, you know, enter their answers that way. Um, and hopefully uh, in succeeding webinars we will have it uh, to that point. But for now, you know, we only have it in PDF, so I apologize for the uh, related, uh, for Elizabeth or anything related to uh, the technical aspects of the webinars. Go ahead and, and type them into the question box if you have any. questions related to anything that we covered today, the history of disability, um, the medical model, um, any of the folks um, that influenced the field. I'd like to just kind of um, mention a couple of things. I know um, I'm, I'm definitely still looking for people who participate and participate in all the webinars. You'll get a $50 gift card, your certificate of completion. And I'm going to feed you a meal when you come to DVI. You know, people, please contact me at e.jenks at wayne.edu um, and let me know if you're willing to do that. Um, we fine. Um, and we would appreciate your feedback because, again, this is a learning process. It's a field test of a course that we're hoping to develop in the future as well, uh, and use in the future as well. We also want your evaluation, okay? Um, that's a very important piece. You don't need to put anything in a You know, we don't, we need to, we don't need to know who you are for that, just the pre and the post test and the assignment. Um, but we do want your feedback. We um, also, uh, you know, we want to know about how um, the quality of the webinar was for you as far as, tech, you know, you know, uh, appropriately for you, were there any issues? One clarification too, the evaluation uh, is going to pop up on your screen so you can complete uh, right at the conclusion of this webinar and it will also go out in an email reminder to everyone who logged in. Um, so you can complete it that way uh, if you don't want to download it. It's available by phone for clarification of this process, absolutely. You call the DDI main line. I can give you that number. It's 313-72654, and you can be connected to, to me here. As a matter of fact, I'll put that up on the screen right now. We also have number at 888-978-4334. Check here to see if there's any other questions. Thank you for the kind comments as well. Uh, is it possible to receive the part of the, the webinar series? Yes. Uh, for future webinars, we're going to go ahead and have the link up on the DDI webinar archive page uh, when possible via email. However, the, the best bet is to check the webinar archive page prior to the next uh, webinar. Uh, and we'll have a link to the PowerPoint. Yeah. 
um, but you'll be able to access it and download it uh, ahead of time. I wanted to address a, a couple of social workers that were wanting to see these, which is apparently there is there's a different requirement in that your certificate of completion has to say that it was an online computer-based course. Um, so will this be considered that? Um, no. It will, it will not be because technically it's not a computer-based course in the uh, take part in the university course um, or some of the other training sites. This is a live, it's a webinar. Um, and so your computer-based training, okay? It will just give you the CE for the webinar series, which is 13.5 CEs. Um, coveted being management um, credit as well. And Lori, I see your question. Um, yes, I wrote your name down. I'll give it to Elizabeth about your interest in the focus group. Very good. Do we have any other comments or questions from anyone else? Please? Next week's topic is going to be evidence-based practices in the community membership model. And we will begin at the same time um, next week. So I look forward to everyone participating again. And I really appreciate everyone's patience with some of our technical difficulties today as we, um, you know, this is our very first time. So it always, hopefully we got the kinks out. And I want to thank Michael. I think he did a great job participating. And I don't believe we have any other questions at this time. Any questions? If you have any questions off here, please uh, send them to ddi at wayne.edu. And once again, the web page for the archive site uh, is ddi.wayne.edu, as an education, forward slash webinar archive. That's W E B I N A. R C H I V H P. And once again, any questions, send them to ddiwayne.edu. And thank you, and we will see you next week. Take care. The organizer has ended the sected.